Hello, everybody, and welcome to another uh, Cali conversation on science communication. Uh, my name's Dan Fagan. I'm a professor here at the Carter Journalism Institute at New York University, and I'm the director of the Science, Health, and Environmental Reporting Program and the Science Communication Workshops. And our goal, as always, is to produce better, deeper, stronger science journalism in the public interest. And, and that's why I'm especially excited about today's event. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's a pleasure to have David Michaels here and, and uh, also Sharon Lerner, two wonderful investigative folks who really have very different backgrounds that uh, Lee will explain. But I just want to say that for those of us who've been in this field for a while, these are two people whose work is especially meaningful, as different as that work is. Uh, so I think it's going to be a very illuminating evening. Uh, at this point, I'll uh, introduce Robert Lee Holtz, who is a distinguished writer in residence here at, at the Carter Institute and also a science writer at the Wall Street Journal and our tireless moderator of these Cavalry conversations. So here's Lee. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. William Randolph Hearst once remarked that news is something which somebody wants suppressed. <laughs> <laughs> and truthfully, that's our subject here this evening, the science news that someone somewhere in some industry wants suppressed. So welcome to this evening's Cavalry conversation on science communications. We are here this evening more specifically to talk about environmental reporting, the chemistry of deception, and what we all like to call the industry spin cycle. Mislead, delay, deny, repeat as needed. Yeah. People talk of the hard and soft sciences. Truthfully, there is also hard and soft science journalism, and this is the hard stuff. This is an area of science journalism that's difficult in a variety of ways. It's one in which the tools of science, which are meant to illuminate the potential of hazard, often are themselves turned topsy-turvy to help conceal it. This is the second in our fall series. Broadly speaking, our goal is to bring together a leading researcher and an esteemed science journalist to explore how they best bring the general public into the community of discovery. And uh, as Dan mentioned, but is worth repeating, these conversations are sponsored by the Kavli Foundation and the NYU Science Health uh, Environment uh, Reporting Program under the leadership of Dan Fagan. Looking ahead, on November 16th, we're gonna be surfing gravitational waves and uh, talking about the challenge of covering physics a, a different kind of hard science uh, with uh, Natalie Wolchover from Quanta and theoretical physicist, uh, blogger, and quantum lounge singer, uh, Sabine Hosenfelder from the Frankfurt <laughs> Institute for Advanced Studies in Germany. She's gonna find out I've been calling her that and we will we'll see. And uh, on November 30th, uh, we'll confront the latest controversy over climate change in the media with noted climatologist and uh, author Michael Mann from Penn State, and journalist David Wallace Wells from New York Magazine. In our conversation tonight, we're talking about environmental reporting and corporate spin with Sharon Levy from The Intercept, Learning. and, uh, I'm sorry, uh, <laughs> Sharon Lerner, I'm sorry, um, from, the in, uh, from The Intercept, and George Washington University epidemiologist David Michaels, who has written extensively on issues related to the integrity of scientific information, and he is the author of the book we have in front of us uh, this evening, Doubt is Their Product. Uh, until this past January, uh, David served as the Assistant Secretary of Labor for the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, uh, which we all know better as OSHA, because who can say all of that in one? Um, and he was, of course, nominated by uh, President Barack Obama, and oddly, unanimously confirmed by the U.S. Senate. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I should say that no one actually, uh, as far as I know, has held that post longer. Right. 
Uh, he worked to strengthen workplace safety in high-risk industries, improve OSHA's whistleblower protection program, and increase outreach to the vulnerable populations who are at greatest risk for work-related injury and illness. And before joining OSHA, uh, I should say that he served as the Department of Energy's Assistant Secretary for the Environment, Safety, and Health, where he was responsible for the health and safety of workers in the communities surrounding the nation's nuclear weapons uh, facilities, which when I was covering as a reporter were often referred to as national sacrifice zones. Um, <laughs> among other things, uh, David uh, developed the initiative to compensate uh, these nuclear workers in the weapons complex uh, who developed cancer or lung disease as a result of exposure to radiation, beryllium, silica, and other hazards, which uh, so far, uh, at least by official calculation, has provided over some $13 billion in benefits um, to sick workers and their families. Author and journalist Sharon Lerner covers environment and health for The Intercept. She's also a fellow of the Investigative Fund. For those of you who are not familiar with it, the Investigative Fund is a journalism fellowship project of the Nation Institute. Uh, it's kind of a virtual newsroom for independent journalists, and it helps uh, foster investigative reporting projects, uh, particularly those with potential for social impact. And her work has impact. She has focused on the way corporate pollution affects ordinary Americans and how failures within the environmental regulatory process, sorry, David, um, <laughs> prevent us from protecting uh, ourselves from industrial toxin, uh, toxins. Her work has been used in congressional hearings. It's uh, helped uh, encourage the U.S. Air Force to continue use of the PFC containing firefighting foam, and it has helped get uh, some chemicals listed um, as hazards in the Stockholm Convention. Her work has appeared in the New York Times, The Nation, Washington Post, among others, and it's been much honored. She's received awards from the Society for, the, uh, Society for Environmental Journalists, the Women in Politics Institute, and the Newswomen's Club of New York. She's also received a National Headliner Award for her radio reporting, and uh, she was a senior fellow at the New School up the street. And uh, in particular, she's the recipient of the Ray Brunner Science Writing Award from the American Public Health Association. Uh, in recent years, she's been reporting and writing an ongoing series, I think numbering 13 or 14 parts at this stage, um, called the Teflon Toxin, which focuses primarily on the DuPont Company and its manufacture of perfluorinated chemicals, or PFCs. Uh, which are used to make hundreds of consumer products, including Teflon, and it's a safe bet that every single one of us has got it in us. Uh, what can you say? Um, the Society of Environmental Journalists called her series a, uh, a hard look at the legal maneuvering some chemical manufacturers use to evade scrutiny of and potential liability for toxic chemicals that they produce. Now, this is not... Uh, easy stuff to, to, uh, to deal with. It's not uh, uh, the household words. They're even hard to say. But they require, it seems to me, a certain quality of dedication, even obsession, <laughs> to pursue. And I'm curious how the two of you got the bug. What bit you, David? Um. I was turned on to first occupational health by a guy named Tony Mazaki, who was the um, uh, activist leader, one of the leaders of the Oil Chemical and Atomic Workers Union. He's from Brooklyn originally. And I was working at Montefiore Hospital in the Bronx, and he had come to Montefiore and said, you know, if you want to train doctors to understand what's going on with workers, have workers do it. And I worked on a program with Ernie Drucker, who's in the audience here, where we put medical students with uh, union locals in New Jersey, at Boundbrook, at Union Carbide, American Cyanamid, places where you know, the, the chemical industry was big, and this was in the 70s and 80s, where it was very productive, and um, saw just these tremendous exposures and realizing that uh, this was interesting and, and work really needed to be done. And I got very turned on to the area of occupational health and worker health. 
um, and continue doing that. I never thought I'd be here with OSHA, but um, it was a, a, I had a, a really great experience. I really learned from Tony and from these workers. So you were inspired early on by some academics that you encountered. As well, actually, and I'll, I'll just put a plug in. Someone gave, I never heard of epidemiology, but it's a fabulous field, and someone gave me a book called Causal Thinking in the Health Sciences. And it sounds like a dry textbook. It but, does. But, <laughs> it, it's, but it is the opposite. It's written by a guy named Mervyn Susser, who um, was a very close friend of Nelson Mandela in the 1950s in hmm. South Africa. He was a, um, there were a few white physicians who were supportive of African National Congress. And, you know, there were a handful of physicians and literally millions of, of Africans with no access to healthcare. So the idea of personal medicine made no sense. He said, we have to think about population medicine. And he wrote this book about how to think about causation in populations. And you know, you, I read this book, which included you know, some, a little bit of math, but mostly you know, there was Mao Zedong and Bob Dylan and various discussions. <laughs> and, and I read this and I said, this is what I want to be when I grow up. I want to be an epidemiologist. I'd studied history at City College before that. Well, now this is interesting. So, so great, you studied great, history, great book. took epidemiology, public health, yeah. decided that was your, yeah. your, your road as a, as a researcher. Yeah. And Sharon, if, if I understand correctly, you also studied public health at a certain mm -hmm. point as, as an academic mm -hmm. and, and kind of slapped yourself in the mouth and said, oh my God, I can't possibly do this, <laughs> but well, I might want to write about it. Well, it was very <laughs> clear to me in going to public health school that I wanted to be a writer. So, <laughs> you know, but I also was very interested in public health. So I, it, what I wanted to do and which I, what I actually began doing in public health school was to write about health. And it was, it just seemed like it made, sense to me. For many years, I wrote about health in, in a, you know, I, I covered it in a more straightforward way. I mean, I covered politics, but uh, I wasn't doing environmental stuff. Um, when you talk about the bug, books were important for me too, including this book right here, which, um, which on, on my desk is all, you know, dog-eared and written on, and, and as is Dan Fagan's book, um, which uh, I, which was a revelation to me, both of them, because part of what seems w still so daunting, what is so daunting about writing about these things is, you know, the uncertainty. And you talk to yeah, editors yeah, and they say, they say, but can you show the connection? Okay, they live across the swamp from a, you know, a, a, a factory that's been using these radioactive, but like, but how do you prove it? How do you, you can't, you know, did they, and was there a good study? There was no study, you know. But to me, what um, what was revelatory about these books was this sort of diving into the uncertainty. Like your book is about uncertainty, and in, in a certain way, so is Tom's River, where it's like let's let's deal with this. It's all about spin, like ha to to. And so now, I I guess it kind of made me. Uh, I ended up writing one uh, big environmental story that kind of just took me away and I, I realized like, oh, this is, this is uh, very, it, there's so much here I could spend the rest of my life doing it. And, and partly it's the, the science that's engaging, but I, I think uh, what was there for me and what has been in so many other stories for me is um, this power imbalance and the sense that um, people are, are grappling with these things that are so much bigger than they are and, and trying to, um, Help write that imbalance by by pulling out, you know, the bits of the truth that we that we can find that we can piece together. So anyway, um, I guess I, I got the bug recently, hmm. really. Hmm. Recently. Yeah. Well, you you kind of brought up two like really important things that I'm hope we're going to talk about uh, this evening: um, power, power imbalance, uh, but but even more important than that, perhaps, is uncertainty, doubt, yeah. um, and. Doubt, of course, is at the heart of skepticism, the heart of the scientific process in a good way. But in this area, in occupational safety, um, industrial environmental uh, topics, and perhaps more broadly now in other science policy issues, um, doubt has kind of taken on a different role David, you're, you're kind of nodding well, there. What? Well, I think what happens is people who want to protect a product, you know, I call them the product defense industry, have realized that if you um, apply the framework that we all apply in the criminal justice system, that people are 
innocent until proven guilty. You could always put off that proven guilty because we're talking about probabilistic statements. And epidemiology never has the gold standard proof when you're talking about exposure to you know, a Teflon product or a plastic or something like that because we can't do clinical trials. We can't randomize people and say you're gonna get exposed and you're not. So you have to look at these natural experiments. You have to look at the places where people are most heavily exposed. And you go in there and you see the effects. But on the scientific level, you know that industry can hire you know, 10 scientists and pay them a lot of money and do things that are ethical and some things that are phenomenally unethical to make it look like there's still uncertainty. And this is, of course, the tobacco model that we now see in a lot of pesticides and some of the Teflon I'm sorry, products. the tobacco model, would you expand yeah, on that? Right, the tobacco model is basically in the 1950s, we had the first studies showing that people with lung cancer were more likely to be smokers than people who don't have lung cancer. And we only saw it in the 1950s because cigarette smoking didn't really take off in the United States until World War I when the tobacco industry gave free cigarettes to soldiers. So you start smoking in the teens and 20s, and by the 50s we had the first signs of an epidemic of lung cancer. And uh, you know, Hill of Hill and Knowlton went to the tobacco industry and said, you know, if you, if you accept the fact that tobacco causes lung cancer, you know, your industry's in trouble, there's always uncertainty and you could go after every study and make it uncertain. So the, so the tobacco industry, they had, you know, um, newsletters they would send out to physicians and scientists focusing on everything that caused lung cancer other than tobacco and raising uncertainty. You know, they had articles, you know, bald men more likely to get lung cancer. I remember, you know, hitting a certain uh, <laughs> uh, personal interest there. Um, and that then became, that was like, you know, but tobacco could get away with that for a long time because they could always say, look, even if tobacco does cause lung cancer, it's your choice. You know, there's, six, starting in 64, there were labels on cigarettes. So you're taking, you're making the choice whether or not you want to expose yourself to this chemical that might be carcinogenic. That changed with the first studies that showed that secondhand smoke causes lung cancer. So if you live with a smoker, if you're a bartender and you don't smoke, you're still exposed to enough tobacco to increase your risk of cancer. At that point, tobacco had to really take on this issue and they had to be much more creative. They hired a bunch of very smart scientists to sort of pull apart the studies, to do different things. And those same scientists and those, that same approach is now used widely in you know, plastics and what was used in benzene to defend asbestos. I mean, you can just name the chemical. It's the same people in the same approach. But and I, I have, to, I have yeah. to sort of play devil's yeah. advocate well, here because I'm the only devil here. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I, I don't like smoke. I'm a former smoker. I mean, to use it as an example. So yeah. um, uh, what's wrong with, you know, industry hiring experts and conducting peer-reviewed research and doing what you well, do or what we would cover Oh, with uh, physicists, astrophysicists do gravitational waves. We'd say, oh, well, you know, how many people did you have or how many subjects or how long did you stare at the sky or whatever? I mean, this is how science goes. What's wrong with this? Well, you know, if you give me an epidemiological study that someone else did and you tell me, see if you can massage the data to come up with the opposite conclusion. For the most part, I can do that. That's an easy trick to do it post hoc. Um, and if you set up your own journals, which many people do, that essentially guarantee publication, they're vanity journals, but they look like they're peer reviewed because your, your peers are, I mean, you essentially can make this parallel universe of saying, look, we have all these studies that, that you know, show that tobacco doesn't cause lung cancer. And they've done that. And they did that for enough time till eventually you, know, you lose. They lose eventually. You know, there's no more debate anymore on secondhand smoke, but they were able to delay it for 20 or 30 years. And that's, that's, that's the trick. And the great thing about tobacco, because of the lawsuits, is there are millions of pages of documents, and if you dive through those, you find exactly that strategy, and they write about it, and they say this is exactly how we're gonna do it, and what's gonna cost. Right, but we, so, so we all yeah. know, okay, so smoking is terrible. Yeah. And, you know, that's a well-established thing, and, and shame on the tobacco industry for yeah. using this, this uh, clever public relations ploy, whatever. But I mean, how does that work now, when you, Sharon, encounter, oh, I don't know, uh, PFCs. Well, um, I mean, it was, what I mean, is the playing about, field for you? So when you were talking yeah. about, well, did it, what was the exposure elsewhere? When you, when you DuPont uh, was on trial for uh, its liability for a woman's kidney cancer recently, and she had been exposed to the, the uh, PFOA. PFOA, sorry. One yeah. of these yeah. 
chemicals. The part of the larger group yeah. is now, to confuse everybody, was called PFCs, yeah. now it's called PFAs, <laughs> whatever. The, anyway, the, but the chemical she was exposed to is PFOA, uh, which was, uh, you know, epidemiology had shown it in association with exposure uh, to PFOA and kidney cancer. She had kidney cancer, and the DuPont attorneys brought on these experts to say, well, you know, isn't she sort of overweight? And couldn't it be because of her weight? And couldn't it, you know, and to like raise all the other possibilities. And that's, that's you know, uh, I guess a, an a established, uh, you know, that's how they do. And, and of course, right? And it should be noted um, that uh, she won that case, but that, you know, the pursuit of that particular chemical, um, this, this was last year, 2016, uh, you know, it, took, I guess, 17 years, really, to get to the point where they were ever held really responsible in that way for, for injury. And, it, and that chemical, even though it uh, went through a very it was sort of um, windy process, they managed to evade regulation. It's not a regulated chemical, as the vast majority of chemicals aren't. So now we have lots of people around the country who are exposed to them who don't have, uh, and millions really, we don't have ways, who don't have a way to get their water cleaned or don't have a way to hold anybody accountable for being exposed to them. And I mean, one of the things I'm writing now is again about these same chemicals, which I can't seem to get away from. In this uh, case, the story is a military one uh, about the firefighting foam. And again, you see when I'm reading through these documents, the same strategies, you know, the military folks have these, you know, well, you know, it could come from your carpets and it could, and it's true, you know, you can get exposure from your carpets, but it's also true that the people they're talking to uh, live near, I in what they, they're drinking contaminated, water that has been contaminated from the military bases. So, you know, it's, it's a tried and true. I'd strategy. like to sort of drill in here for a second. Um, there are a great many um, occupational and industrial toxins out there. Um, how did you as a reporter settle on the particular active ingredient, or, or not active ingredient, but key ingredient in Teflon of yeah. all things? Well, I began <coughs> that story with this series that keeps going thinking that I was writing about Chris Christie. Um, <laughs> which so this began, like so many things, in New Jersey. Yes, it began in New Jersey. <laughs> and I heard about uh, this, they have this little group called the, uh, I think it's the New Jersey Drinking Water Quality Institute. Now, you know, uh, it's like a little, you know, they, they meet regularly, I guess, every couple months you know, in a little not remark uh, unremarkable little room, nothing, they, they're a bunch of scientists and their job is to set standards for water contaminants in, in drinking water. Um, not particularly exciting work, really, they're crunching numbers and they did it, they've done it for decades. And I don't remember how I came onto this, but basically uh, in the process of attempting to set a water quality standard for PFOA in New Jersey, um, as, as that process was moving along and they're publishing their, you know, here's my working paper, here it's coming out soon, you know, there's a, a, a paper trail, um, lawyers begin to show up at their meetings, and which nobody ever goes to usually uh, beyond the members, and uh, they were attorneys from DuPont. It was getting a lot of interest from DuPont because it turned out uh, DuPont had a plant there in New Jersey and had le left a lot of PFOA in the water near it. What was interesting to me was that this water quality, drinking water quality institute, uh, uh, basically after decades of meeting regularly uh, was shut down uh, right before they were going to you know, issue their water quality standard and didn't meet again for, I think it was four years. So uh, when they did meet again, so I was like, it, and it really, and in that time, DuPont attorneys were going hard on the governor and writing to, you know, and to the, they were meeting with the head of the DEQ and they were saying, don't do this, don't do this. Well, this and is all exciting and <laughs> intriguing and maddening, but I still want to know 
How, what, was, how did I get there? what was the, the fly on the well, end of the hook me, that the, got I mean, you? I mean, right there, that was like, Not what? everybody's wandering right. around New Jersey well, looking for I, meetings I like confess, this. I confess, you know, I found this interesting. Not everybody else does. But what happened, <laughs> what, what happened was that as I'm chasing this, to me, really interesting and weird story, someone tells me that I should talk to this guy, Rob Ballot, who is an attorney in West Virginia. And it turns out that, like, not only is this going on in New Jersey, uh, but the very same chemical uh, contaminated the water in West Virginia. Uh, same process, they were using it for de uh, Teflon and, and other products. And he had a very crazy story to tell. And not only that, he had thousands of documents to dump on me, which I love. So <laughs> I, you know, I remember like sitting up all night and reading that they had, you know, that these guys, the, ma the main gist of what he was showing me with those documents was that the executives of the company had known for a very, very long time about the dangers that the chemical played. They, they had all this research showing, you know, experiments on dogs and cats and rabbits, showing, you know, they're developing tumors, they're having kidney trouble. So they had this incredible record of their own research on the chemical. Then they also realized that the chemical had spread into the water. They actually had, you know, measured it and and but hadn't told anybody. And so, so to me, I mean, part of what's so hard um, about, it, it, about writing about these things is actually getting your hands on, on stuff that can prove what is usually just a hunch. Like, this doesn't seem right. This doesn't seem right that the water board, you know, the Water Quality Institute shut down when they're looking. But, you know, you can't really prove it, but you can prove it when you have, you say, you have this document for years. You had this document for years. You knew about the harms. They were studying their own workers. And right. so, and, and, and so, they were. So what do you do? Do you turn to someone like David? Well, I, I mean, mean, who at this stage is a outside, independent. Uh, so you mean expert? to interview him? Well, or to or to say, am I crazy? Or you know, uh, uh, what's going on here? Uh, well, I what? think it was pretty clear what was going on there. But I did, <laughs> I, I did interview. Well, you're a suspicious person. Oh, sure, but I mean, I did interview tons of health and legal and uh -huh. policy experts. I'm sorry, I didn't call you. <laughs> well, I, I wouldn't have been allowed to talk I to meant, you I meant, the government. And you'll yeah. forgive me even more for this. I meant you generically. Because yeah. <laughs> um, there is this uh, necessary relationship right. between uh, state and federal regulators and journalists who wander up the alley of a particular industrial toxin. Right. And, and I mean, in short, though, really, the reason to wander up that alley was because there was all this documentation. And the documentation included all these interactions with federal employees at the uh, EPA in particular, who were in very, very close contact with DuPont. Uh, and I ended up writing about that, about how, you know, the effort to regulate was always um, it was hampered by their real in, uh, close and intimate connections to the company, which was, you know, they had a, a defense team for this chemical that was headed up by former uh, EPA administrators. They had a former EPA administrator on their, on their board. They were in constant phone contact with the EPA as they were rolling out and negotiating this regulation, mm -hmm. which ended up, or non-regulation as it turned out, which ended up being very, very favorable to them. So I feel it. Yeah, no, yeah. this is good. So, so, yeah. so, David, what does this look like from your side? Your side in yeah, this case, no, I, your your side in yeah. this case being, you know, a, a regulator. Uh, uh, this is something we call if I may, if industry I may. capture. Industry in capture. In fact, it's very common. What does that mean? It means essentially that industries that are regulated get very close to their um, regulatory body, to their regulator, um, and often. Uh, after a few years, the person in charge of the agency or a high-level official who's gotten their ticket punched in that agency can go to the private sector, make a much uh, higher salary. And sometimes there are ethics considerations that they can't have contact for a year or something like mm -hmm. that, but often they don't have that depending on what rank they were. And we see this all the time. And they did just, yeah. they did have that and they violated it. Right. <laughs> Um, At least one bio person violated, violated that, violated. that yeah. period of, yeah. you know. Well, that, yeah, that, that, that ban sort of moves around. And if, it not, if mean, you're following the, yeah. there's a lot of articles right now about uh, glyphosate, which is a Monsanto uh, pesticide. Roundup is sort of the mm -hmm. uh, more well known. There's been a series of articles, there's one in the nation this week 
Um, you know, Sharon's written quite a bit on it. There's a whole series in Le Monde. And the person who was head of the pesticide office in uh, of EPA is seen throughout the, um, the memos from Monsanto that have come out in these court cases, essentially saying, I'm going to help you do this. And then when he retired, started to do some work for Monsanto. It is a very serious problem. Um, I would see it all the time, and say we, and I, even when I was in the government, outside the government, see that person is about to go over to the dark side. We would say. <laughs> you know, I'm tempted to ask. <laughs> <laughs> you know, why aren't you wearing a more expensive suit? I know. Um, <laughs> I, know. I think you know. I mean, most people who had an OSHA do it for a yeah. couple of years, then they go work for a law firm that sure. are, represents sure. employers against OSHA. Yeah. I want to linger for a second. I'd like to unpack so, this yeah. for a minute because yeah. this is something. Yeah. Uh, so you, you mentioned very quickly uh, in, in your earlier remarks that I think you call it the product defense yeah. business. Um, so if you're not going to work for, say, a company that's being regulated, I mean, we often that's a big issue, say, for instance, with military contractors in the Pentagon, and yeah. we hear a lot about that. But here we are not just talking about uh, a revolving door that opens into a regulated industry, but there is this um, group of communicators uh, and research uh, shops, I guess I'll call them, um, uh, that also are, have, has, has sprouted up that has inserted itself into this process. Can you want to tell us a little bit about there, that? Yeah, there and then I'd like to know how you have bumped up against this. So. No, there are some very, very successful firms that understand exactly how this works. Um, and they're uh, dominated by people, some of whom were in agencies, but some were just smart enough to figure out how to do this. And they have multi-million dollar contracts with manufacturers of chemicals or different products um, to produce science uh, that will slow down regulation or to be used in court. And there's a very close relationship. The, one of the big fears of many of these manufacturers is actually court cases. It, and you know, the court cases always are based on these probabilistic um, calculations. And so there really is uncertainty. And you know, did this woman who had ca kidney cancer, would she have gotten it without that exposure? Obviously, we'll never know, but the court has to figure that out. And so uh, you have consulting firms and academics as well who can essentially now publish studies that will be used in court cases. And they're clearly being published for the sake of use in court cases. They're not science to really advance the under understanding of science. You know, you can make a lot of money if you're very good at this. I've decided not to do that. I think it would not be, I don't think I could sleep at night, but it does raise these interesting questions that what if people who do that think? And, and there's, it's worth a discussion around that, I think, because there are people who clearly, they spend their life essentially defending products. One of them has been nominated to be the, the assistant uh, administrator of EPA for chemicals and toxics. He had a, uh, the, on when, next Wednesday, the uh, Environment and Public Works Committee of the Senate is going to vote on confirmation of Michael Dorson, who is really one of the, a former high-level EPA person who then went and set up a small institute where he is making uh, good money defending chemicals. Well, but for the so sake of discussion, yeah. why is this different from the normal kind of hard-nosed critique that you get in a peer review process? I mean, what if you're wrong? But, right? I mean... Well, the interesting question is when you're talking about, you know, this is again applying this concept of um, chemicals are innocent until they're proven guilty. If we're not sure, we have to say, well, what's the consequence of making the, uh, the mistake, the, the type one or the type two error? If, we, if it looks like this chemical is dangerous and we're 85% you know, sure it causes cancer and people are exposed to it, should we wait till we're 100% sure? I mean, this becomes the, the policy question mm -hmm. and that's what things pivot on. And it's, it's very easy to sort of frame it as saying, well, we need more studies or the studies are contradictory. Um, and that's really, that, that's the model, and um, mm -hmm. it will slow down regulation. And what's great, though, is occasionally through uh, journalists like Sharon and others, when you find the, the memo that says, this is what we need to do. There's a wonderful memo about the, um, uh, yeah. the calculations yeah. that were done by uh, Sherry Rowland and Mario Molina in the 80s about um, the uh, fluorocarbons that were causing a hole in the ozone. Yeah. And this was actually, theoret they did this theoretically. They said, look, we can uh, see exactly what's going to happen here with all these um, materials that are in spray cans. And it's causing a hole in the ozone, or we think it is. We haven't measured it yet, but it's clearly it's going to happen. Um, and that's going to increase, among other things, a lot of skin cancer, other, other big problems. 
And they, they presented this data, and DuPont went to Hill and Knowlton, and we have the, map, the Hill and Knowlton actually sales DuPont picture. DuPont being one of the major manufacturers of, chlor of, of chlorofluorocarbons. And DuPont said, uh, Hill and Knowlton said, you know, they came to us because they really wanted to just delay regulation for a couple of years so they wouldn't lose market share. They could come up with an alternative. And they did. And so they delayed any sort of control for a couple of years. We had a couple more years of the ozone hole ex expanding and how many cases of skin cancer. DuPont didn't lose market share. You know, Roland and, and Molina actually got the Nobel Prize for that work not long afterwards because it was so clear. Yes. But they still wanted to hold on to market share, so we're willing to say, let's fight the science for a couple of years. And th that's the story. So, so how does this, so, so there's a profit and delay, okay. Yeah. Uh, and there's a likelihood you're wrong. There's no. always a likelihood, but um, it's small. Now, as a, as a very a remote, in that, in that remote. Case, well, in that case, remote, it really was I mean, remote. you know, yeah. five sigma, you know, yeah. tiny, you know. Um, <laughs> from your standpoint, yeah. how do you broker this blizzard of what on, in another field would just simply be Oh, run-of-the-mill conflicting studies about a controversial well, subject right, well, that is dumped in a journalist's lap, as they yeah. often are. Well, one of the things, to go back to Dorson. Um, Dorson. He, Dorson being the, the consultant, the, the head of this, this uh, okay. science for hire company who's okay. nominated to head the EPA toxics office. Okay. Um, and, you know, it doesn't make sense, so much sense, though, I'm going to put an asterisk there to you know delve into any one of his studies. Uh, he's worked for many many companies: Coke Industries, Dupont, Dow, T Tobacco, Tobacco, right? Uh, but what? But when you step step back and look at his work collectively, it very consistently and maybe almost always shows that the products are safer than everybody else thinks. So that's a way you can kind of cut through the individual stuff with him. The, the asterisk I'll come back to is, um, again, with the chemical that I've looked so closely at, uh, you know, here we had another memo that was like, you know, a bit of a smoking gun where he had been hired by uh, the state of West Virginia, which uh, talk about regulatory capture, you know, was basically got some ideas from DuPont about who to hire for uh, to help them set a drinking water level for PFOA. And so DuPont, the DuPont guys ask around and they get in an email, which I got, that ended up saying, oh, we have this great guy, you know, he's, uh, he's really good at like blessing whatever level you come up with, you know, <laughs> and you know, he can sell it to whoever. And like, this is who we're talking about as being in charge of the top chemical person in the United States of America. So anyway, uh, that is one example of many, you know, and and I don't know. I mean, I'm interested to hear what you think if he's like exceptional or not. My sense from talking to a lot of people is that he isn't. He's just sort of one of these one of these guys who's been yeah. on the payroll. Now, is this uh, you talked about sort of uh, agency capture? So, I mean, is this uh, the kind of agency capture this, at a personal is, level? This I is mean, what different. Usually, agency capture is you know the the staff. Because we're talking about here, I mean, yeah. from our particular yeah. viewpoint, how do we talk to the right. public about this stuff? We're talking about assessing the, the, the integrity and validity yeah. of a source yeah. either way. Right. Whether you should be paying attention to them as a regulator or you should be paying attention to them as a journalist who is then going to lead the charge in the virtual pages of the intercept. <laughs> no, this is a concern. You know, we rarely see such a blatant... Uh, nomination, though the Trump administration is doing things that no one's ever done before. Um, but regulatory capture happens on many different levels, and it's much more icy with the permanent staff. And, you know, the heads come and go, but the permanent staff are used to working so closely with these companies, and they, they, after a few years, they may go work for them. Um, but if I, to talk about the journalism, though, if I, could, I think what's powerful about the stuff that Sharon writes and others write is sort of capturing the science and also the sort of the, um, the um, reasoning that the companies use and, and documenting it and saying this is what we're doing and why we're doing it and that's the very tough thing. But also linking it to the stories of individuals and putting them, you know, taking you to those towns where this is going on because that's what moves people. You know, the story just of the, sca you know, another, you know, EPA related scandal or another scandal about a, um, you know, company covering up data doesn't move people. 
it's the individual story. And, but you have to have both. I mean, I think you're, that, that combination is really what's powerful and requires those sort of writing skills. Yeah, I mean, it makes me think, there, it, I'm, I am always looking for that intersection where you have, there's a science story to be told and people to tell it. And, and there was, um, you were talking before about sort of, you know, how hard, unless you have, a, you're very hard to show cause and relation yeah. and, uh, and result. And I did find recently, I'm always trying to figure out how to do that. And I found recently, I was scanning through the national air toxics assessment data. Just for fun. Just well, for that's fun. That's what you have to do, no. though. That's to what you have to do. And and uh, and I think a you know more skilled Excel user would have just put it into <laughs> Excel. I can't do that. But so I was just literally scrolling through it, and it's basically they measure, or they used to anyway. Ah, they yeah. still do, uh, but they measure, calculate uh, everybody's risk of cancer from air pollution based on where you live, yeah. based on the toxics inventory, which is like what the you know, factories near you emit, which is kind of interesting. So anyway, it, they do it per million, and uh, every on average, it's less than one. So for every million people in the United States, on average, less than one is gonna die from cancer from air pollution. I was scrolling through, and it's usually zero, one, zero point zero, whatever, very low. And then I came to a place that was like 800. And I was like, what? You know, because it was mostly nothing. And then all of a sudden, really, really high. And it was, nothing was even close. And so I, what is going on here? I found the census track number, went and found the census, the actual, you know, what businesses were there. This DuPont plant, another DuPont plant, <laughs> a different chemical. But I ended up, but it would help me, once I figured out, okay, that that's weird. And then I figured out it was, the only uh, place that manufactures neoprene left in the United States. And it's the only plant mm. that uses one particular chemical. And, and so it made it very like, oh, I get, and so when I went there, there were people who were in fact sick. And so that's kind of a way, like that's uh, just finding, mm. just to say, finding the, the, the intersection. So you look for the outlier. Well, sometimes it's a good way to do it because, because again, you want to be able to say with some level of, you know, of credibility that there is a connection here. And, and I think, uh, you know, I think it was. Professor yeah. Fagan, you have a, an inquisitive air. <laughs> I do. Uh, first of all, I just want to remind yes. everybody, feel free to uh, come up and, and answer, ask your question. So. I think that you guys have very smartly outlined sort of the, the two big paths for these kinds of stories, the conflict of interest path, and then also the risk path. For the people in this room, mm -hmm. and I agree with David, the, be it's the best stories involve both, tend to. But for the people in this, this room, it's the risk path that is sort of more of a sweet spot because most journalists are really too intimidated to try to get into the question of what is the risk and and wh wh where is it? So I guess my question for both of you guys, and, and, and uh, in my experience, the way that you identify those risks is just through a willingness to be to be bored, you know, to, <laughs> to, to spend hours just scanning uh, databases like like the one that that uh, Sharon just mentioned. So give us some, some favorites uh, of ah, yours, of course, yes. stuff that's oh, sort of hiding in plain sight. It, it really isn't hiding in plain sight, but, it, but it's out there. No, hiding in plain sight. Uh, yeah. Sharon used a wonderful phrase that I hadn't heard before because I don't get around much. When we were talking prior to this uh, thing, she said, you know, so much of this stuff is buried in plain sight. Yeah. Buried in plain sight. Yeah that it's there There's if a you can look. There's a tremendous amount of it. So can you yeah. tell us about uh, that? Dan, that's well, a great question. I have um, as, as a technique, I mean, so I, I can go home and do this. <laughs> um, during the years of the Bush administration, I was at George Washington University, which I've just returned mm -hmm. to, but um, uh, OSHA was ordered by a federal judge to issue a standard on hexavalent chromium. Chromium causes lung cancer. OSHA had delayed for a long time, and the Bush people said, we're not gonna issue any chemical standards. So, 
Uh, I'm sorry, this chemical is used for what? Uh, chromium is commonly used in paints. That's a very common. It's also used mm -hmm. in water systems. Um, the whole Aaron Brockovich, yep. uh, which is drinking uh, chromium, though it's much more dangerous to breathe. Uh, uh, OSHA did move to issue a standard, and I was writing, about, and industry um, and some of these product defense consultants uh, published a study purporting to show that there was really no risk at these lower levels. And I'm an epidemiologist, I read the study, I thought, you know, there was, the study had no, what we call power, statistical power. They didn't follow people very long, it was a tiny study, you couldn't conclude anything. But it was um, sponsored by this chromium industry coalition, which I had never heard of. So I started Googling it, and it showed that there was a bankruptcy proceeding around that. The chromium industry. The chromium system. industry, co the chromium coalition. industry coalition or something that paid for it. Mm -hmm. And um, so I discovered this bankruptcy proceedings and we went on, I have a colleague who understands the, um, some of the legal Googling better and there's something called the PACER system which has federal, all federal court cases for a very small amount of money. You, could, yeah. you can look at them and we found all of the, um, the people who, the, or organizations who were owed money by the Chromium Industry Coalition, they were his in bankruptcy, the list of creditors. And so we just started cold calling them. <laughs> um, and there was a law firm in Indiana that said, you know, we have this box of, of studies. We don't know what to do with them. <laughs> and they sent them to us, and it was just unbelievable. <laughs> we actually, ah, they and, sent them to you. Yeah, and they said, sure, I mean, you know, here, take them. And there was a study <laughs> that actually OSHA had asked for, said, do you have any data like this? And they had done a big study and were just hiding it. Eventually, we gave it to the EPA, and the EPA actually took the chromium industry to court and won a big case against them that then was overturned mm -hmm. in the appeals mm -hmm. court for various mm -hmm. technical reasons. Mm -hmm. But that they were hiding this data, and we just, you know. Okay. Now, this is something yeah. that you did as an academic. Yes, I did this. You did this as a, well, this is, no, this is yeah, important. Absolutely. Because yeah. one of the things we're interested in here is, well, journalists, well, we know what we do, yeah. you know, when we want to make something public, when we want to cause, uh, uh, affect a change yeah. in something. But how an academic goes about that, how a scientist who's a researcher takes this public. Yeah, I always felt that I wanted to do more than just crunch numbers. And I, um, I continue to do epidemiology for quite a while. I don't really do that anymore much, um, though I love reading it. But you know, if you want to have an impact, you have to think about not just what the numbers mean, but you know, what they mean in the larger sense and, and how they play out in the world of regulation and litigation. Um, and I had been in the government, in the, in the um, Clinton uh, administration, and particularly saw a couple of these examples around beryllium, for example. Beryllium is an important chemical in making nuclear weapons. Mm. And we issued a standard that was 10 times stronger than OSHA because it was clear to us that people were getting very sick from low levels of beryllium exposure, but the beryllium industry fought us and they had the same consultants. And so I got very, so when I left the Clinton administration, I said, this is really an area I want to work on. And so as different mm -hmm. um, potential scandals came up, I started just pursuing them. And that ended up being a bunch of things I published in the academic journal, and I mm -hmm. turned that into a book. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but there's stuff out there. So there's stuff out there. <laughs> Sharon? Um, okay, the example I'll use. What's your problem? <laughs> yeah. Well, so no, what, what, are, what are the things that you yeah, think? You so mentioned going through the it, Yeah, year, so year, here was something data. that was sort of hiding in plain sight. Not, well, so we've talked about PFOA, the chemical that was in New Jersey and in West Virginia. Well, this was another case where, you know, they, they get on, the EPA gets onto it in, you know, 2003, they start investigating. In 2005, they start negotiating with, with DuPont. And they, again, give them plenty of time to introduce a replacement. But nobody really knows what the replacement is. They, they advertise it, they market it as Gen X. So, you know, what is this? Nobody had heard of this thing a couple of years ago, but I, I was trying to figure out what this replacement was. And uh, I had heard that its uh, chemical name was confidential, which, because this is a common thing that chemical companies say, uh, sorry, we have to protect this. It's sorry, we spent all these, uh, this time and money researching it is confidential business information and can't be shared. So they can legally do this. Um, the, 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 the technical... The actual chemical formulation. Yeah, which of course would reveal something about it its would. structure. And would. And then, but in reporting the previous stories, I had come across a scientist who lived in Zurich who said, actually, 
the, the chemical formula for Gen X uh, is available. And I said, where? And he said, it's on DuPont's website. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, um, uh. And in fact, it was. And so <laughs> I, I took that, uh, that actual, used that to go somewhere else that was plain sight. I went to the EPA's website and I plugged it in and I did a search of something called the 8E reports. In the the what reports? They're called right. 8E. And what they are 8E. is adverse incidents. So ah, that okay. kept these companies have an obligation to report if something untoward happens that they observe in their lab. So uh, I used this chemical formula. I used the mm -hmm. EPA website, which we can all go to. I put in the chemical formula. Uh, to search for ADE reports and bing, 16 <laughs> reports come up that show that the chemical does pretty much the same thing that the first one did. <laughs> it was causing cancer in lab animals, it was affecting their hormonal systems, their kidneys, the same thing. So, so uh, that was gratifying and weird. <laughs> gratifying. Uh, you know, <laughs> and awful, but it was gratifying to find it because no, basically, I they, they, so clearly they had made it public, right? But it's like they hadn't told anybody that it was public. And it, if the tree falls in the far, I, I just like how you, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. I n I, nobody knew how to look for it. So anyway, there it mm -hmm. was. And then unfortunately, now that we know that it's toxic in pretty much the same way that the first one was, and it's been introduced, it, and of course the first one isn't regulated, the second one is even further from being regulated. Right. And it also happens to be now in the drinking water of 250,000 people in North Carolina. Uh, and probably elsewhere too, but people really, ha we just can't catch up, you know? So people haven't even gotten to the point where they can test all the water for it. And it's just, anyway, but that was a story of okay, many so, things in So you, sight. you as an aggressive uh, and uh, nimble uh, journalist who can run faster than a speeding regulatory agency. Um, <laughs> well, anyway, that's, not, that's no hard. Yeah, no, I understand, I understand. No hard. <laughs> and, and, um, <laughs> Sir, I, I know you take this in the right spirit. No, but, I, I, uh, I'm the first to say <laughs> it. Yeah, no. Um, uh, I mean, we're all sad you're gone. Um, uh, but what, what then do you do with this information? How do you Publish it. No, no, but yeah. what's that process? <laughs> I appreciate that. I appreciate that, and we're glad you did. But, but what's your process? So you well, go to your editor and you say, well, here's this chemical that isn't regulated. Um, I found some reports that say it's bad, yeah. but you know, almost all chemicals are bad for you somehow or other. And, I had and your editor properly says, well, okay, so what's your authority? What standing do you have today? What's the testing? What's the this? What's the that? And then show me who's hurt. Yeah, okay, so I took those 16 studies, and because of previous reporting, I had talked with many scientists already mm -hmm. okay. about the other, the original chemical PFOA, and I went back to, I think, three or four toxicologists. And I, I broke them up. Some of them were about reproductive studies. I gave them to the reproductive toxicologists. I, I oh. basically, uh, so, I so have a lot of- So you kind of set up a kind of peer review panel. Yeah, because I was like, I think I know what these say, but you know, I'm gonna ask yeah. people who, uh, you know, I wanna confirm right. that I'm right. And, uh -huh. and okay. they did confirm that I was right. And, and yeah. And, if, and can, can I just add though, yeah, there's a whole it. sort of uh, group of, of environmental scientists who are eager to be of assistance to intrepid reporters, there's a science communication network. Um, there's actually even media training for these scientists so they know how to talk to people like you. And they're, they would be happy to answer questions, you know, say, does this mean what I think it means? Or can you tell me what this means? And yeah. they're certainly, well, they're out there eager to talk to reporters. We, I mean, we keep saying we're eager to get questions, yet we keep okay. not allowing there's anybody there's to ask. Okay. Okay, sorry. And, okay. and now that I've established I'm a, I'm a question hypocrite, I wanna, I have a question. Thank you. Um, so in, in writing about um, like risk that's emerging about an exposure and you're starting to see the ep epidemiological studies sort of mounting up, but um, as a writer, you know, like watching this and wanting to um, be able to communicate the uncertainty that's still there, you, you know, you can run into the question of, well, if there's so much uncertainty that you wanna make clear to me um, why are you writing about it in the first place? Um, so about, I guess um, my question is about how to um, be able to communicate both those things, the uncertainty that's still there and also the stakes um, that, that 
So how do you honor the uncertainty without falling into the trap of being a shill for well, whoever wants to make this go away? Is that, and, that, and is is that what you're getting? Yeah. Okay. And yeah. All right. I so think it's challenging. And, Karen, how do you avoid I, this? And I would say, and I again, I refer to both those books I mentioned head on. You know, just say what you you know. It is. Uh, you can't say that any individual. Can, you know, you can't say that Karen's you know, neck tumor is a result of her living next to, you know, be as specific as you can and put it right out there, you know? And then like, you know, and, and then you address the conflicts of interest too, you know? But like, you know, the tumor registry that, that won't, you know, show cancer cases on, you know, on a, on a small level is funded by the chemical industry. And there's, you know, just put it all in there and do it head on, I would say. There's a there's a, another question in there I think, which is how are you f how could you how do you be fair about the uncertainty? Yes, I, I think this is where actually you can call on scientists to help you do to help you explain that because any one study doesn't give you the answer anyway. You've got to look at the whole sort of constellation of studies and is there toxicology? Is this the first epidemiologic study? And also talk about how widely are these exposures? What's the significance of this? And so, you know, it's a challenge, mm -hmm. but you've got to put that all together and say, you know, this, you wouldn't ever uh, write a hard-hitting story about the first study that finds something, because it could just be chance, or there are lots of reasons. But if you're saying it's, you know, it, it's come to this, you know, there are a bunch of animal studies, and all of a sudden, here's the first study that's finding a human. And then, you know, what's been the response of the manufacturer? What's been the response of the EPA? And you could put together that, that study. Now, once there's a lot out there, then it becomes, you know, the, the Teflon story, and you've got the smoking gun. But even the, the initial studies are interesting, and then, you, then the question more is, here are these studies, and you can ask the government, you can ask the manufacturer, what's your plan? Yeah. Are you going to do more research? How do we going to figure this out? Because it's important to know we're not going to just keep the exposures going until, you know, the bodies are in the morgue. So that, that becomes, a, it's a different question. It may not be the, the hard-hitting, rigorous, you know, let's stop using this, but th there's a good story there. So how, how long have you been working on the Teflon story? How many years? Well, the first one was in August of 2015. Okay, so a couple years. Yeah, and I mean, it, it's sort of a, like beat reporting. It's just they're <laughs> really long. <laughs> so you're in a position to be able to make a, a particular chemical your beat. Right, I do other things too, I should say. You I do? Mean, yeah, <laughs> no, I do, I do. Okay, what I, else do you do? I cover, uh, you know, stuff that's going on in the EPA, pesticides, uh -huh. other, uh, you know, I wrote about uh, Dorsen, I, I, all sorts of little stories, and, and investigative stories too that are not about this chemical. Well, I'm asking in part because, well, I understand, I think perhaps, you know, we, we think we understand his structure. He's got a university, there's funding, or uh, he's tenure. in an agency, that you helps. know. But for an environmental journalist who is interested in becoming obsessed about a particular sure. hazardous yes. chemical, I mean, what's the support structure there? I, I, I um, like when you right. first got interested in this chemical, you went to the investigators. How did this right. work? So what happened? Well, I had a grant. From this was I was a freelancer at the time. I had a grant from the. You were a freelancer. Uh, yes, okay. and but I had support from the investigative fund. Um, and they were supporting this story. And I had known them for years. Uh, and I was, so we, we had a relationship and, I, and they were giving me some leeway, you know, because it was taking me a long time to figure out what it was about. And when I said uh, it was a bigger story, you know, they kept supporting me and they ended up, uh, you want the long version or the short version? Because <laughs> I, I Well, as a freelancer, I'm not a yeah. freelancer, but you are, and so are some of the people the in The short room. version is How that do you, there, there are a lot of adventurous and unusual funding mechanisms yeah. well, for hard-nosed journalism So the now. investigative fund and was And many of them are not legacy media publications. Yeah, okay. so well, the, so. the investigative fund was really what made that, that whole thing possible. And, but I have to really give credit to The Intercept who, um, when I was doing those first three stories, I'd heard that there was another reporter from the New York Times Magazine that was kind of on to them too. And, <laughs> um, and I knew I really wanted to do them first, <laughs> and I wanted to do it <laughs> fast. So I took my stuff to The Intercept and said, uh, you know, I have, you know, I, I, you know, can you do this really fast? And The Intercept took, took yeah, but aren't you it skipping on. a step? 
Oh, you want uh, you want the long. Well, version. I think this is how it works. This is the in, this is. You know, we know what his environment is. I want to know more about yours. So, so okay, well so you had this great idea. Yeah. You had this relationship with the investigative fund. And they took me, they hooked me up with the Washington Post. They hooked you up with the Washington <laughs> Post. And the okay. Washington Post was like, great, you know, we'll take you on, you know, you, you're, you are welcome to work with us. One of these dandy cooperative ventures and we now see a lot of. And it was the investigative team at the Washington Post, okay. verified, you know. And... And I explained what I was doing. They were all, you know, go for it. And then they heard about the, and then, or I don't know if I told them. Somehow, we all heard that the New York Times Magazine was there was a it. competitor on and story. And they, they cut me loose. They dropped oh. it. They did. And oh. I, and I was, I suddenly. That's not very competitive. Well, they no. didn't want, and they didn't want. They were like, well, what do you, ha what do you really have? You know, well, isn't this just all out there? And like, you know. <laughs> Isn't th and well. I was like, no, I, I you know, <laughs> I got it. <laughs> but uh, so I just became like, I, yeah. I just became very uh, determined to get it out before the New York Times. Well, you know, I, I want to linger on this for a second, okay. not to make fun of the Washington Post, although that would be good. Um, <laughs> no, it's a great, it's a great organization that yeah. is really doing incredible stuff, as is the New York Times. Yeah. But this disinclination to butt heads with the competitor, um, is this? They want a sure thing, you know they what I mean? They sure wanted thing. it to be like, do you have an explosive story that only you have that, you know, and, it, and it's like, and all, the other thing that was getting them was that people knew a little bit about, some about PFOA and about DuPont. Some Because it's rebels. buried in plain sight. Yeah, and there have been scientists and a couple of people who are right. And there were a couple of big lawsuits that already had been finished yeah, down and, in, and a, in so West Virginia, what, Ohio. Yeah, and because of that, some right. of um, the documents had been coming out, but kind of dribbling out. Yeah. And so, but nobody had kind of the bigger, and I, so I, but I, I, so I got very, I don't know, I just got very hell-bent on making it happen. And okay. Then <laughs> um, so, but you lost your pony. I mean, you lost yes. your... Your and outlet, you and lost and your support and crew. And so what happened, so as mm. I, so. Which is a editor, occupational hazard for freelancers. Yes, oh. and, and, and I needed not just, I needed a publication, but a publication that could, I mean, the, that could do a very long and thorough job, like, and put resources into it. So The Intercept had just started. I knew the editor mm -hmm. from having worked with her when she was my editor at The Nation. Mm -hmm. I, um, I, th my editor, who is now still my editor, had just come on board, and uh, we went to him and said, you know, we have this big thing, and, and not only did they take it, but then they took me on basically eventually full time, and I really have to say I've never worked at a publication before where, you know, not only have they let me go down the rabbit hole with this, but part of it was like, part of the story took me to China, and I said, I think the next part of the story is in China, and they said, go. You know, and with the, with the, and they also, you know, public. I don't even know how many words it is, but it's ridiculous. Mm. And <laughs> and also with other stories that have been uh, other stories that uh, I think many other publications would have said, whoa, you know, uh, one in particular about a woman, an environmental activist who um, ended up being convicted by the EPA and the Department of Justice, and uh, she. Uh, it was a very long, crazy story, and in the process of exploring it, I figured out that she was not a perfect person, that she had maybe done some small level lying, but the story was about a much bigger thing, and I said to my editor, I think that, you know, this person maybe lied about this thing, and he said, go. You know, <laughs> like, people aren't perfect, get on the plane and go, and I feel like that, um, that kind of yeah. trust and, and sort of, I don't know, mm -hmm. willingness mm -hmm. to take chances has been very, I'm just mm -hmm. really grateful for mm -hmm. it. Wow. So David, yeah. from, from your perspective, um, both as a, as a long time um, uh, uh, epidemiologist with, a, with an abiding interest in these matters, but also someone who's pursued uh, public life in a variety of ways, from your perspective, are there a lot of people out there now who are taking these kinds of chances? Uh, I think there's a lot of interest right now um, among freelancers, among people who work in digital publications and in, um, you know, the leading publications, you know, the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Washington Post, like never before. Um, a lot is because of the, um, the, the, the um, terror of the Trump administration, really, in saying, what, what will they be doing? So, you know, the, um, I think both the Post and the Times have 
hired up a bunch of reporters who are just focused on the regulatory agencies and trying to figure out what's going on. They assume that you know all sorts of deals are being cut. And so I, we get phone calls, I get phone calls every week from a reporter or two or three from leading publications saying, do you have any stories about what's going on in OSHA? Um, you know, what do you think of this? Um, and there's a lot more appetite for that. I think there's no shortage of stories outside though. I mean, I think what the EPA w is doing and what they will be doing is something that's gonna be very important to cover. But I think there are lots of other stories out there um, which can be found locally, looking at some of these data so sources and, and figuring out what's going on, not in Washington or New York, but places where some of these factories are, where some of these, these mm. exposures are taking mm. place, which I think can be very exciting. Um, and certainly places to well, start. Well, I, I guess I'm asking this in part because um, your story, I mean, your relationship with the investigative fund and the intercept is pretty great. You know, it's admirable that you've been able to forge this. Um, mm. These are stories yeah. that require an attention span. Um, and as you suggest, uh, uh, they, they often root uh, uh, locally. Uh, I plant in West Virginia, you know. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Are those outlets at that regional or local level there to support this? Local publications? Yeah. Mean? Well, I don't know what, <laughs> when I, w I just came from the Society for Mo Environmental Journalists Conference. A great organization. Yes. And, uh, you know, people were coming up to me saying, I cover Gen X. I'm the Gen X reporter in North Carolina. Really? You know? <laughs> it's her beat, you know? Uh, and a, a number of people who, um, who really are of necessity are being mm -hmm. focused on these environmental crises. I mean, people in upstate New York, the Albany paper is really covering mm -hmm. Hoosick Falls. And, you know, I think that um, there's a lot of reader interest in these things. And I think to a certain degree, they're putting folks on them. And, and then, you know, from, from a national, you know, for national publications, part of what is making my work possible is, uh, you know, with the Trump, uh, the, when Trump was, you know, I, I'm going to say elected, but whatever. He's when he. I think that's the technical. It term. is. Uh, but my travel budget was increased substantially, and and by uh, someone, Pierre Omidyar, who funds the Intercept, but who actually put a lot of money into a number of uh -huh. different publications uh, after the election for, I think, really just this reason. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Um. Because I wonder when I, I was, I should tell, I, I want to share a personal story, actually. And talking to the two of you before going in this reminded me, uh, in 1977, when I was a beginning journalist, my very first job at a small town in rural Virginia that, strangely enough, had a DuPont plant. And, uh, we don't mean to pick on DuPont. No, right? it's not. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and uh, I, w I won't, you know, go into great detail, but, you know, they made fiber raw stock and they made the raw stock for something that was called Orlon, which used to be a very popular fiber, which I don't think anybody wears anymore. Um, but uh, in the process of making that, one of the catalysts was uh, mercury. Uh, and it's hard to find a more well-documented, right. more generally agreed upon, nasty, toxic, bad for your health substance than mercury. And uh, it turned out uh, in my, practically my first story as a journalist, mercury was discovered to have been badly uh, disposed of in the plant and migrated out of the ground. And as best one can tell, permanently poisoned a, a large section of a very lovely scenic river called the South River. That was in 1977. This past summer, 40 years later, DuPont, which was the company that announced they had the mercury problem in the first place about a substance that there was no contest, no uncertainty. Um, and uh, they even were happy to kind of walk reporters around and show them where it was. 40 years before they signed a consent decree. And wow. this summer, in July, I think, they signed a consent decree to $42 million to remediate the damage to the river. Um, the largest such settlement uh, in Virginia history, which says something about the state of yeah. Virginia environmental <laughs> affairs. But what, in that case, yeah. I bring it up, what is the value of that kind of delay 
Earlier you mentioned sort of securing market share in the case of CFCs, but what's the value oh. of even in an open and shut case like mercury in the water that you yourself found? What's the value of that delay? You know, a dollar next year is worth, you know, is it's more valuable to have a dollar today than, um, you know, a dollar five years from now. So you're, if you can delay any sort of expenditure, you're saving, your, your accountant will tell you you're saving money. Is, is that everything gets your, discounted? Your, is that your perception? Yeah, and don't you have a section about mercury in there? Oh yeah, I mean mercury is, there, oh. you know, there's no well, discussion, but there are lots of <laughs> terrible examples like but, this. But actually, you, uh, yeah. if I can ask you no, a question. No, yeah, yeah, I wish you would. Because <laughs> there's a sentence in your book about mercury was is the, it's basically next the next decade. You know, well, so well, the the big issues are there are a lot of uh, neurological issues around methyl mercury, especially yes, yes, yes. mercury organ inorganic mercury, the quicksilver, right, um, can be turned into mercury, um, both basically by in, in or by anaerobic bacteria, and then goes up the food chain. Yeah, yeah, it's concentrated so, in fish. Right, exactly. Yeah, and then yeah. if you eat a lot of fish, you know the famous stories mm -hmm. in Minamata, Japan, where mm -hmm. um, first you had sort of um, cats running in circles and birds flying upside down, uh, and then no one realized it was really mercury that was in the fish, because the cats and the birds ate mercury. Then um, there was this huge, terrible outbreak of uh, children being born with just these mm. you know, you know, really tragic birth defects, um, which we call Minamata syndrome. Yeah. And, it's, 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 and the bigger concern now, and there's a big, actually, EPA did a lot of work on this during the Obama administration, that um, it's concentrated in fish, so you know how much fish should we be eating, and especially pregnant women, there are categories of people who probably should stay away from certain types of fish. Right. Um, but mercury itself can be quite dangerous, just even you know inorganic, the you know, quicksilver right. mercury. If you breathe it, drinking it's probably not nearly as serious. As but you're not answering but her question. Why is it the why is it the contaminant of the next decade? Well, because yeah, why now? Because Cause, cause, because it's because I think of it as the contaminant because, of the 1950s. Right. <laughs> because, <laughs> well, <laughs> it, it's a contaminant of coal, and if you we're bur especially if we start burning more and more coal, more mercury will be uh, go into the water mm. system and then go up through the um, you know the the fish the food chain, and we'll be eating more fish, and the more fish we eat, the more mercury we'll get, and um, it. You know, there are studies in places like the Faroe Islands where the people eat a lot of fish. And, um, mm -hmm. There's clearly an effect on kids and their intellectual development. Hmm. Was that, was that yeah, a reasonable yeah, question? Yeah, good. Okay. Yeah, so in listening to you to dis three discuss how, how many chemicals are out there poisoning us, um, I'm finding myself getting very, very frustrated. And I'm curious how you keep yourselves from spinning out into a just out of control rage no, an and anger. Yeah, that's an excellent question. What yeah. is the emotional cost of covering yeah. this stuff? Yeah? Yeah. yeah. You, you want it? Well, let me start. Well, no, I mean, it's, no, I want to hear yeah. from Sharon first. We, we yeah. just well, I mean, I, you know, to keep from spinning off into a crazy rage, I'm not sure that I've succeeded in that. Um, <laughs> But, uh, you know, I do, I know that I think about these things too much, and I try not to, you know, I don't know. I, I, the truth is I am in a crazy rage, you know, for, for a lot of the time. And I think, and I mean, and I have kids too, and I, it's very hard not to think about exposures all the time, you know, uh -huh. and little growing bodies. But I don't know. I mean, you just, but I, I guess... I think that environmental journalism is sort of an antidote to that. I don't yeah. think I would necessarily, I guess I would be thinking about them less, but it, it certainly is a way to, to um, it's, you can do something. So it, it, that's, and you can that do helps. Something. And you don't but you are in a crazy rage. Sometimes. She's not, I mean, Sometimes she's not wrong. Sometimes I'm in a she's crazy rage. Yes, that's okay. true. And what yeah. do you do? With my crazy rage? Yeah, you don't just say, well, someday we'll, that could change. I mean, what do you do, literally? I mean, I feel like I go to work, you know, that, that, I mean, or I don't know that I'm really in a crazy rage. I feel I get upset. The th actually, the thing that puts me like emotionally most off kilter, I would say, is writing about climate change, which I do sometimes mm -hmm. uh, in various <laughs> ways. And I, uh, you know, I, I don't know, like what to do with that kind of existential dread, yeah. David. 
Well, no, I, I think, I, I mean. Yes, I, existential dread. Over to you, David. Yes. <laughs> well, I think, I think it's important to be angry. I mean, you don't want to be irrational or out of control, but you don't want to become immune to that or ah. hardened. And no. I think that's the, the bigger fear I have, actually, is that you, know, you, you read enough of these, you see enough of these, and you forget this is about people. You know, we um, always talk about this as, you know, statistics are just people with their tears washed away. You have to remember uh. that this is about people. And that keeps you going and says, this is why we're doing this. And, I, you know, I've been very privileged. I've been able to be in situations where I think I can see I've made some difference. But, you know, there are a thousand times more that we need to do. But I think it's really important to keep pushing forward and say, this is, you know, if we don't do this, if we don't take this on, it'll, things will be a little bit worse. Other questions? Or did you like the light over there? Or <laughs> you've been very The patient. light is nice over there, but it was only one factor that contributed statistically to why I went there. Um, so I'm uh, one of the Sharp students here in the program. Uh, I was formerly a chemical engineer for a while, uh, so I'm a big fan <coughs> of The Intercept and OSHA. Uh, and um, my question is really about kind of on a <coughs> macro level, the scope of the risk of just the volume of man-made chemicals that have been made in the past, you know, century and a half or so. I, I can't tell you how many times I was in a lab and looked at a material safety data sheet for carbon nanotubes or some other, uh, you know, like boutique molecule that was being used for, mm. uh, you know, a set of reactions to get to a sellable product, and there was no data. It was more or less blank. Mm. It just kind yeah. of said, uh, you know, th in the space where it would say, here's the, you know, the maximum dosage in parts per billion or parts per million that you ought to be exposed to before you start seeing potentially negative effects. And it was empty. Yeah. And uh, it, it's just curious to me. I think to get to a point where this is like a legitimate question and not rambling. Um, we talked a little bit at the beginning of this, or you guys did, about uh, the industry's side of this, which is sort of like uh, all uh, chemical products are kind of innocent until proven guilty, and there's the environmentalist perspective that's sort of the precautionary principle, and like who in the policy realm is talking about some sort of reasonable, actionable way to deal with a brand new chemical that we know very little about in terms of its effects and when it's safe to introduce that or in an ideal scenario when it would be safe to use That's it. That's a good question. Yeah, I think I mean, you've raised a very good question and a very challenging one. I mean, the, you know, we don't have an overall picture of the effects of all these chemicals. Obviously, at one level, we're doing very well. You know, up until recently, um, our lifespans were uh, mm -hmm. lengthening. That's changed a little bit for a lot of people in the United States, but not so much for the for um, the chemicals we're talking about. We don't know the impact on um, you know neurological development of kids. You know, I don't think there's any question that because we took lead out of gasoline, mm. you know, decades ago. You know, my kids and and some of you are smarter than your parents. Yeah. <laughs> because you know lead takes three, four, five points off people's IQ, whatever that means. Um, and do these other chemicals impact um, development in different ways? Yes, they do. We don't know how much in the broad sense, but they definitely do. And they also don't do it evenly. The, if you, you know, people who grow up in sort of, you know, upper middle class homes and live in big cities have a lot less exposure than people, you know, than people who live in rural areas who are drinking water from different, you know, different water supplies. You know, the New York water system is great. But if you're living, you know, if you grew up in Camp Lejeune in North Carolina, you had mm. exposures from when you were a kid to trichloroethylene. So it's, it's, we don't know the answer to that. This was something that um, certainly within the Obama administration we wrestled with tremendously and every decision you know, were, were just these huge sort of wrenching discussions trying to weigh out all these things, what do we know, what do we don't know. You know that's all out the window now. You know, it's like mm -hmm. boom, boom, let's get rid of all these regulations. So Sharon, so for you, what's the good outcome of your reporting? What's, what's What's your, what's the thing that will quiet the crazy rage well, on this story? When it, I mean, if, I mean, a lot of the stories that I'm, what I'm writing about are exposures that are unsafe and it's, it's 
stopping the exposures, I guess. I mean, that's often what I'm writing about, not always what I'm writing about. No, but but um, action, you know? And like, it, it, it's, it's gratifying uh, just when, you know, uh, I was just hearing that, you know, the, the, some of the stories about Doris and made it to the folks at the Environmental Public Works Committee in the Senate, and they're talking about it and using it. Like, thank you, that's great, that's wonderful. Now hopefully they can, you know, it, it's just to, I guess I'm interested in, you know, changing. In so changing. you want to affect the process. You want yeah. to get a chemical off the market. You want well, to. Well, I mean, I'm not an I'm activist, but I guess what I, what I end up writing about or, you just you know, said you're not an activist. I'm not. Okay, no, I just want to make sure I heard that right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't think, I think of myself, no, I, I, as really a journalist, but I, you know, but the, I'm most often writing about problems, mm -hmm. you know, that need fixing, and I don't mm -hmm. always know to ha how to fix them, but it's to raise them up and have the people who can fix mm. them. Because science journalists are yeah. often tagged and sometimes properly so, as go, oh, you know, you're cheerleaders, you know, you're, well, no, no, and, and the, the, the science journalist who's not a cheerleader, we actually have a different word for it, and we call them environmental writers, you know. Right, right. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's, there is this assumption within the field that like, well, it's, there is a, 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 a component of activism. There is a, a desire to affect change that's present as a kind of background level of whatever you want to call yeah. it in the environmental reporting community, whereas in the science journalism community, if I can separate those out, you know, it's yay, look at science, science is good for you, open-ended well, curiosity, we're discovering the universe, gravitational I waves, mean, yay, you know, I mean. Um, I hear you, so with, I mean, for instance, again, with, the, with this long series, I don't know what the answer is. I <laughs> don't, re I mean, I have some ideas, but mm -hmm. it's so big and complicated, at this point, it's just kind of, it really is about bringing light and understanding, because uh, it's so it's so complicated, but it's clearly of import. It clearly matters. It's in people's drinking water, and I wanted to go back to what you were saying uh, earlier about that. You know, there are all these scientists willing to help. Uh, I have found that um, in terms of just like bringing light, that that I kind of feel like I'm part of this really international team of people trying to figure this thing out. And we, you know, I now have all these people I talk to, a lot of them never for attribution, scientists mm. and uh, lawyers, and, you know, who will share things with me and actually also sometimes bizarrely are now asking me questions, you know, mm. but, but where it's just kind of like this, this effort to understand, you know, and so it's not, uh, again, it's not really clear to me how this all will or should play out, but, but I feel like, uh, you know, there, it's an, a, a naughty situation that I'm trying to untangle. There's a question here, please. Hi. Um, so we talked before about industry capture and um, sort of this meeting of scientists getting shut down. And I was wondering if either of you ever felt sort of explicitly or impl implicitly threatened by some of these big corporations who have their own interests at heart. Threatened as in? Physically? Tires well, slashed? Uh, maybe <laughs> pressured in some way. Huh. Or you just felt like you really had to get your data down pat because you know they'd be coming for you. Well, you always have to do that. I mean, if you're playing in the big leagues, you know, you have to, you know, be very rigorous. You can't you can't be sloppy. You have to know. You've got to document everything. You've got to footnote everything. You know, publish it in peer reviewed publications. I always did. Um, you know, I, this book has twelve hundred uh, references, oh. citations. I put them all up on the web. Um, the, one of the characters in this book is a guy named Dennis Pausenbach, who does a lot of work for industry. Um, I got a call from the Defense Research Institute. Uh, which is the mm. law organization of lawyers who defend corporations, and said, would you be willing to debate Dennis Pausenbach at one of our meetings? And I said, well, you know, if I, if I wrote this, I ought to be able to stand up, and I, and I did. Um, and he didn't find, he couldn't find a single mistake in there. I, sa I said to him, you know, show me anything I got wrong. He said, well, you got the context wrong. But you have to do that. And so I've never, I mean, there was, you know, uh, before this was published, Oxford University, hired Oxford University Press hired an attorney to go through this to make sure <coughs> that they were worried about being sued. Sure. And I'm sure they paid that lawyer many multiples of my advance <laughs> for this book. 
And um, I learned a lot about libel. It turns out you could say almost anything you want about people who are dead. <laughs> turns out um, <laughs> no, that's the libel law. Um, but they were very careful, and you know there were there was never a threat of suit. But that's what you have to, you have to be really good. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So Sharon, from your side, have I been well? The only particularly time as a freelancer, well, where someone well, you, know, you yeah, get to yeah. sign these yeah, no, awful that contracts. That has never to, been you know. an issue, and, and okay. these days it's not an issue. But um, I guess I would say for most, with most of the corporate communications folks, I have a very cordial relationship, and I think it's really important to keep it that way. You know, mm -hmm. the, I mean, polite, right? Yeah. Um, I will say that when I, I was recently in uh, Louisiana. Uh, at a um, an oil refinery, or I, w I was by, by a chemical plant and uh, walking on a public walkway, but uh, you know it turned into a whole. Th you know they they uh, no. they, they uh, the sheriff came and told me I had to. I was taking a picture and I had and uh, I had been there with a photographer earlier and and I ended up having you know that. Apparently, you really can't get anywhere near these chemical plants without getting in lots of trouble. So I had the FBI, you know, contacting me. But that's the only thing that's happened. To me. <laughs> and this is now because it's a homeland security issue. Yeah, it was a homeland. Yeah, yeah it's it was amazing very, how that gets. It, uh, and then it turns out there are a lot of, you know, all the photographers I talked to. Oh yeah, you know, <laughs> so uh -huh. it's a thing. So the industry people you talk to are cordial. Uh, um, for the most part. Uh, I will say that uh, a couple folks have said, we don't want to talk to you. You know, I mean, a lot well, of people don't call you back. We, uh, we don't want to talk to you. We don't think you want to write the truth kind of thing, you know. What about you, Dan? Do you want to write the truth? <laughs> what is truth? <laughs> Seriously, uh, you have a question. So we're almost uh, out of time, sorry to say, but I, I did promise some folks that we would, we would have tangible tips and I've got a couple of my own uh, just Good. to get the ball rolling L litigation is an endless okay. source yeah. uh, so go to the courthouse and pull everything uh, and you know public databases my favorite used to be the toxic release inventory although it's weakened now and and full of holes so for each of you all, what you know, if you, if you had just sort of a couple of two or three specific tips of places to go, places you know, sort of places to sort of mine for these sort of shiny objects hiding in plain sight, where would you go? Well, I think we've already mentioned the absolute best one, which is Pacer. Which is <laughs> your pace? <laughs> the yeah, yeah. Federal no, because court yeah. the explain, federal court. Uh, yeah. well, well, because uh, you know, I'm, I think we share this. You know, I have yeah. I have no resources. I mean, I have to look for other people to do stuff for me. Right. And my view is the world works for me. Right. And here you have, uh, as reflected in the yeah. federal court system, like three really important things. One, somebody's filed a lawsuit. There's a defendant and there's a plaintiff. They're self-identifying, and they're in discovery, so there's paper, and it's all on the record. I love paper, you know, and I like to start these kinds of stories, which I don't do as much of as I used to, with the paper trail, and then secondarily go to people. But that's what the federal court system offers you. And a lot of these cases tend to be fought out in state court, but that's just... That's squirrel for me. That's squirrely. It's harder to get at. It's over here. It's over there. Right. If you've identified something like you did with the West Virginia case by looking in that uh, air quality uh, database, yeah, that uh, was well, then there. it's great. Well, then you know where to go. But if you're just fishing, right? Um, yeah, federal court yeah. database for me is, is the best. SEC thing. is another one. SEC records. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry, and ahead. the Freedom of yeah. Information Act we yeah. haven't talked about. You know, the Freedom well, of Information Act. Well, there's a reason for that. <laughs> but it's it doesn't work. It's, well, but it's still <laughs> worth doing. And yeah, it is. It is. And you, it is, yeah. you know, and you, you hear stories about people getting things that are improperly redacted. So you see more mm -hmm. things that you, know, you just have people who are just bored, so they're doing the redaction. Now, within the world of EPA and some other agencies, there's something called confidential business information. And what many say uh, that again? Confidential business information usually, uh, uh, s you know. You CBI, they'll say, oh, that's CBI, you can't have it. Um, all, everything that used to be sent in under the um, 8E and the Toxic Substance Control Act was always 
you know, manufacturers would always stamp everything CBI, including like newspaper articles right. that they would be sending in. And you have to challenge that. But, right. but um, as so challenges. what's the vehicle for challenging that quickly? I don't know, actually. But, but okay. we would be on the other, I was All on right. the other side of those. Don't so take no for an answer. Yeah, right. right. That's uh, if you go to your former agency, what's the yeah. place you would go? What's the paper thing? What's the database right. that you'd like well, to you, go to? You go to the Freedom of you say, I want all letters, communications, emails with this company, everything, anything um, of any of your divisions that ever dealt with this chemical, ever mentioned this chemical. Emails are really interesting. And ask for, you have to ask widely. And, and because you're a journalist, you have to ask for them to waive the fee. And there must be some standard um, letters mm -hmm. that you just mm -hmm. plug in okay. the phrases. So, so you like the Freedom of Information Act? I've been on both sides of it. Yeah. For, when you're inside, you hate it because okay. it's a tremendous amount of work. And you know the you know people who are always going after OSHA for one thing or another um, would be asking. Rare, sometimes they'd be useful things we thought, but for the most part, you know the the um, you know the companies who we'd be yeah. issuing citations on would then say, "Give us okay. everything about this." And so Sharon, what's your favorite tool? Oh, um, well, regard. I would say there are two. Uh, I, I read a lot of sciencey journal things, like <laughs> another hiding in plain sight thing. Like, you know, there, if mm -hmm. you know, I guess you sort of have to know what to look for, but if you have talked to scientists, go to scientific conferences, be on listservs sometimes, you mm -hmm. can hear what they're talking about and actually try to read through some of it, and it's like, it helps, you know? that it, it actually helps. Um, so uh, industrial occupational journals, is that what? Yeah. Okay, and well, going to conferences. Well, maybe trade journals, I would trade think journals. also. Trade, trade association type, you know. What else, what else? Um, I, I also get a lot from lawsuits and I also get a lot from these, from just, conversations with just being in regular touch with people who are uh, mm -hmm. working in the field that mm -hmm. I'm covering and you j you know s a lot of times you're not going to be able to write about it but if you have the channels mm -hmm. open then you know then mm -hmm. they'll yeah yeah in the end and we are surprisingly at the end Dan said at the beginning this would go fast and he wasn't kidding mm -hmm. um, we have uh, identified uh, another source which neither one of you have mentioned going forward for people who are interested in this topic and want to pursue it as a journalist or as scientists who want to reach out to the public about this, which is the two of you <laughs> um, and Dan and other environmental uh, activists and journalists who, unlike other fields, form a quite wonderful supportive network. And it's important to take advantage of that. I'm certainly glad that we have been able to take advantage of you two this evening. Um, it's been, this is a really hard to talk about, it's really hard to report, uh, and it's really hard to see the light at the end of the tunnel. But at least the two of you have made us feel very confident and very good about the process mm -hmm. that we are in the middle of. And thank you very much for that. Well, thank you. Thank you.